take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign over all the circumstances of your life and praise God in the darkness. Let God's word strengthen your heart. There should be a passion in our heart to tell everybody how they can come to know Jesus Christ. Stand, please, for the reading of God's Word. I want to read the first 15 verses with you here today. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. May God help us to... Receive his word today. You may be seated. Thank you so very much. Would you pray with me? Father, as we go into this passage of Scripture, would you please open our eyes, open our hearts to receive the truth and apply it to our lives. For your glory's sake, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For several weeks, we've been doing a series on spiritual disciplines. The theme verse that we've used is 1 Timothy 4, 7, exercise thyself rather unto godliness or discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. This is the advice that Paul gave to Timothy as he was encouraging him in his spiritual life. The word exercise, as we noted before, is uh, from the Greek word gymnizo, where we get the word gymnasium, and Paul is using an athletic metaphor And in essence, what he's saying is the discipline and the training and the passion that it takes to compete and win in any athletic competition is the same discipline that is needed in the Christian life. Spiritual disciplines, then, are those personal and corporate disciplines that promote spiritual growth. They are practices that we do regularly that change us with the power and grace of the Holy Spirit. It changes our sinful habits into good habits, or to simply say spiritual disciplines are good and godly habits that will aid us and help us in our spiritual growth. Now, last week we looked at the discipline of Scripture, and today I want us to look at the discipline of prayer. I think these are the two most important disciplines in the Christian life, the Word of God and prayer. So here in Matthew 6 is the Lord teaching his disciples to pray. Now, why did he do that? In the parallel passage in Luke, the disciples actually come to Jesus and they request it. They say, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, that's an appropriate request from disciples. After all, Jesus was their rabbi. Jesus was their teacher. The the, the word disciple is from the Greek word mathetas. It's actually where we get the word math from. It means a learner or a student. When they Enrolled in Jesus' school, they responded to the call, follow me, and after that, Jesus became their teacher, and they would follow him wherever he went, and Jesus would, as he walked, he would teach them spiritual truth. He would teach them the Word of God. 
And they watched his life. They were eyewitnesses of him. But when they heard Jesus pray, it left a deep impression on them. They never say, Lord, teach us to teach like you do. We never hear him say, Lord, teach us to perform miracles like you do, or Lord, teach us to raise the dead. There was something about his prayers that was influential. There was an intimacy about his prayers. And so they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, Jesus will do that, but before he actually teaches them kind of a model on which to use to pray, he will teach them some things not to do. You know, sometimes you have to unteach people before you teach them. And there was a lot of religious praying that went on in that day that was meaningless. Those prayers didn't make it to heaven. It was useless chatter. And by the way, that's still true today. There's a lot of things going on for prayer that are not really prayer. We certainly don't want to waste our time. And so Jesus is going to give here some things to avoid when we pray. And as we learn the discipline of prayer, we need to learn these things, and we need to learn the model that Jesus gives us. So just three mistakes that we are to avoid. Here's the first one. Number one, don't pray hypocritically. Again, look in verse number five. But when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. The Greek word hypocritus, it's a word taken from the culture of that day. It was actually the word used of an actor. It's appropriate. One who assumes the role or identity of another. An actor plays a role that does not correspond to their real life. They're performing. Jesus grew up in Nazareth. Archaeologists discovered um, a Roman theater not far from Nazareth that was was, uh, used back in Jesus' day. So it very well may have been that when Jesus was a child that perhaps Mary and Joseph took him to that theater a time or two, and Jesus saw the Hupocritus actors performing in theater. And Jesus uses this word, and he applies it to a lot of the religious leaders of his day. They were actors. They were performing for a public audience. It was to be seen of men. And Jesus tells his disciples, don't be like that. In verse number two, he says, you know, don't be as the hypocrites are in verse two. And he says it again in verse number five, as we saw. He says it again down in verse 16 with respect to fasting. Don't be like the hypocrites. Don't perform religion for your own pleasure to get praise from men. A, hy- a hypocrite never intends to be what he pretends to be. He preaches by the yard. He practices by the inch. Jesus said, don't be like that. The Pharisees was really who he was aiming at here. They had taken prayer, and they had turned it into an act to be seen of men in public. Again, it was a performance. And what Jesus emphasizes here is the theme of secrecy. You know, there's a secret life of the of the citizen of the kingdom. If you're a child of the kingdom, if you're a child of God, you have some things that you do that should be between you and God, that should be done in secret. Theologians use an expression, quorum dio. It's a Latin phrase that means literally in the presence of God. And it's the idea that we live our life in the presence of God, recognizing that God sees all that we do and he knows all that we do. And what we do, we do it before his face and nothing more. And Jesus said, basically, there's several things that you should be doing in secret. One of them was giving. He talked about giving alms, which was a good thing to do. You're giving to help the poor, or you're giving perhaps to advance the kingdom of God. He says, when you do the alms, in verse number two, don't sound the trumpet. He may be speaking literally there. They may have literally, if a guy gave a big offering, blew a trumpet. We should probably try that one day, maybe. I don't know. Or he could be referring to the fact that there were, in the temple courtyard area, there were 13 receptacles for people who wanted to give, and they looked like inverted trumpets standing up with a big plate top, and you would throw your offering in, and the more coins you threw in, the louder it sounded. You you know, it's sounding the trumpet by your giving, and it became more of a show. Jesus said, no, when you give, don't No, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. This is something that should be done in secret. It's between you and God. I can honestly say, I have no idea what any of you give. I've never in my life ever checked the record to see who gives what. I've I've not done that in any churches I've ever pastored. You know why? It's none of my business. 
And I don't want people coming to me thinking I'm treating people with partiality based on what they give. I don't know what you give. I only know what I give. And sometimes I don't know that because my wife controls all the money in our house. I know I get 25 hours a week allowance if I'm good. Sometimes I don't get it. But that's between you and God. Giving, we don't do it to be seen of men. Fasting, the Pharisees would disfigure their faces. They would go around, you know, with this appearance of gloom. They would neglect their appearance on purpose. Disheveled hair. Oh, what's wrong? Oh, I'm fasting, brother. Pray for me. Jesus said, don't do that. That should be done in secret. And the other thing is praying. Don't be like the hypocrites to be, pray to be seen of men. And what he's referring to here, is, first of all, in verse number 5, is they pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets. There were three calls to prayer in Jewish life. There was one at 9 a.m., one at 12 o'clock midday, one at 3 o'clock. Whenever the call to prayer came out, wherever you were, you would stop what you were doing, and you would begin to pray. It just so happened, and by the way, they knew those times very well. It just so happened that when the call of prayer came, the Pharisees happened to be in the chief places, in the, the busiest street corner. In our vernacular day, it would be in the middle of the mall, dropping to their knees in this pious expression of prayer. Again, they made it a performance. Jesus said, look, when you do that, don't, don't be like them, that they may be seen of men in verse 5. Verily I send you, they have their reward. That is their reward. That's it. You get what you want. You want the praise of men. You got it. That's all you got. They have their reward. But in contrast to that in verse 6, but thou, when thou prayest, Enter into thy closet. Go into the inner room and then shut the door. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. I like the emphasis on thou. It's you. This is personal. This is a singular verb. Personal you. When you, as an individual, when you go to pray, you go into your closet, you shut the door. And notice he says not if you pray, but when you pray. What is Jesus assuming here? That you're going to pray. If you're a citizen of the kingdom, if you're a child of God, you will pray. That's just a part of the Christian life. And so he says when in chapter 6, verse 5, and when you pray. Verse 6, but when you pray. Verse 7, and when you pray. And verse 9, and after this manner pray ye. Pray is in the imperative there, a command. After this manner you pray. Again, it's a command there. Jesus expects us to pray. Jesus commands us to pray. God word, God's word makes it clear that we are to pray continually. Colossians 3, uh, 4, 2, continue steadfastly in prayer. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Martin Luther expressed God's expectation of prayer this way. He said, quote, As it is the business of tailors to make clothes and of cobblers to mend shoes, so it is the business of Christians to pray. And that's true. One of the most convicting sermons I ever read was by Jonathan Edwards. He's the one who wrote the sermon, preached the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, that sparked uh, the Second Great Awakening, or excuse me, the First Great Awakening. He uh, preached a sermon called Hypocrites Deficient in the Duty of Prayer. And the whole thesis of the sermon is that those who call themselves Christians and do not engage in regular secret prayer are what he called unconverted hypocrites. And this is what he said, quote, However hypocrites may continue for a season in the duty of prayer, yet it is, it, it is their manner after a while in a great measure to leave it off. And then, and then listen to what else he, he said to his congregation. I would exhort those who have entertained and hope of their being true converts, and yet since their supposed conversion have left off the duty of secret prayer and do ordinarily allow themselves in the omission of it to throw away their hope. If you have left off calling upon God, it is time for you to leave off hoping and flattering yourself with an imagination that you are a child of God, end quote. That's pretty strong pretty strong. 
I would agree that a true believer will seek God in private prayer. So the place is your closet. That, that quiet place that you find where you privately go and you meet with God and you pray. And the priority here is unto thy Father in secret. It is unto the Lord. That's in contrast to being seen of men. We don't do it to be seen of men. We're doing it in private, quorum Dio, before the face of God. We're doing it unto the Lord. True prayer is unto God to be heard by God. James Montgomery Boyce said this, I believe that not one prayer in a hundred is directed unto God. And what he meant by that is that people go through the motions and are not aware of being in the presence of God. R.A. Torrey said that that's the one thought that changed his whole prayer life. That he would go through the motions of prayer and finally he got to the point where he uh, stopped and he thought for a moment that What he's doing is he's going into the presence of God, and he said that one thing changed him, that he realized that he was in God's presence. So he said, when you begin to pray, you should not even utter a syllable until you are conscious of the idea that you are before God. Think about that. So don't pray hypocritically. But here's the second thing Jesus said. Don't pray heathenistically. Look in verse number 7, what he said. But when you pray... Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Jesus said, don't pray like the heathen when they pray. Don't don't be like hypocrites when they pray. Don't be like the heathen when they pray. Now, what is Jesus referring to? He's talking about practices that were common back in that day that people were accustomed to. When 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 pagans or heathens would pray, their prayers were mechanical prayers. They were saying words without a heart. William Barclay, in his discussion of this passage, pointed out how that prayer had devolved in Jewish life. It had become ritualized. The wording and forms of prayer were set, and they were simply read, or they were recited from memory. He said such prayers could be given with almost no attention being paid to what was said. They were routine. They were semi-conscious. They were religious exercises. It was all so rote. It was all so routine and repetitious that really was very mechanical. It was uh, Robert Cook who said, all of us have one routine prayer in our system, and once we get rid of it, then we can really start to pray. But then there were multiple prayers. And that's the idea of verbosity, uh, just over and over and over and over again, as if the bombarding of words is going to somehow change the mind of God. Reciting things over and over and over and over. You know, like the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel where they're calling out to Baal all day long. Oh, mighty Baal, oh, mighty Baal. Or in Acts 19, the, the people who prayed to the goddess Diana, great is Diana. For two hours, they kept saying over and over again, great is Diana, great is Diana. Or like Catholics who light candles and believe that their request will continue to ascend as long as the candle is lit. Or like the Buddhists who uh, have their prayer wheel and just keep spinning it as if you're constantly praying to God. That's what it had devolved to back then. One writer noted ancient rabbis maintained that the longer the prayer, the more likely it would be heard and heeded by God. So just multiple, just over and over. I mean, if you, if you read the Lord's Prayer here, it's not really long, is it? But it's powerful. And then there's mystical prayers. Some of the pagans' mystery religions taught that effective prayer was unintelligible gibberish. They could be carried away into ecstasy. It was the language of the divine. And sometimes in some of these mystery religions in the Greco-Roman world, they would get drunk, and then they would get carried away, and then they thought that actually they could have an out-of-body experience where that their spirit went up into the divine heavens, and they could begin to speak in a language that was unintelligible, mystical words. That was what was going on in Corinth and the mystery religion. Some of that was seeping into the church, and Paul had to correct it. Paul had a very difficult task with the Corinthian church. He was trying to separate the false gift of tongues. It was really just mystery religion uh, ecstasy, 
and mystical prayers. They're trying to bring in and baptize and call it tongues, which was not really the tongues of Acts chapter 2. And he was trying to separate the real thing from the false thing. Did you know the charismatic theology today teaches there are two different kinds of tongues? Some charismatics will admit that tongues in Acts 2 are known earthly languages. You can't get away from that because they're cataloged, they're listed there in Acts chapter 2. But then they say the tongues in 1 Corinthians are different. It's a private heavenly prayer language. And it's gibberish. We don't know what it is. It's just this unintelligible language. It's a private prayer language between you and God. It's, an intimate, it's the most intimate prayer language. How can it be intimate if you don't know what you're saying? The, same, the very same words used for tongues in Acts 2 are the ones used in 1 Corinthians 14. There's only one gift of tongues. But charismatics get the idea that tongues is a private prayer language based on a misunderstanding and a misinterpretation of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul's trying to debunk the false gift while upholding the real thing that was still being used at that time, which I think has long since ceased in use from the church because it's no longer needed. So, and the hermeneutical clue, if you ever read 1 Corinthians 14, is whenever he uses the singular, he's talking about, He's talking about the false gift because there's only one kind of gibberish. Whenever he uses the word tongues plural, he's talking about the real gift because there are many earthly languages. And that's the key to really understanding that whole chapter. He's always debunking the false gift. He, he speaks about it in a sarcastic way. Besides that, you can't get more intimate in prayer than what Jesus teaches here. The most intimate prayer you'll ever read is in John 17 when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's not speaking in tongues there, beloved. And when the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, Jesus didn't say, okay, let me tell you how to talk in tongues. That's not what he said. And besides that, in verse 7, he said, when you pray, use not vain repetitions. The Greek word is bada legeo. Legeo means to speak. Bada is a non-word. It's an unintelligible word. Bada, 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 bada. Bada, 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 bada. Swing, bada, 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 bada. <laughs> Doesn't mean anything. Don't use unintelligible words. Don't use gibberish when you pray. That one verse right there should debunk tongues. It really should. It doesn't, but it should. Jesus said, don't do that. Don't pray hypocritically. Don't pray heathenistically. Don't pray haphazardly. Look in verse number 8. Be ye not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Jesus here is, is saying, remember who you're talking to. Take heed to whom you're speaking to. Don't be thoughtless or careless in your praying. You're praying to a God who already knows what you need before you even ask him. He knows everything, everything about you. He already knows what you need. Some people go to God in prayer with a low view of God. Like the Greeks and the Romans had the low view of their gods they worship. Because in their mind, their gods were not a whole lot better than they were. Their gods were selfish, angry, petty, arbitrary, moody. They were not perfect, and they certainly didn't have all knowledge. Jesus is saying, don't bring that low view of God into your prayers. You're praying to a king who's sovereign, who knows all things, who can do anything. He's a powerful king, but also he's your father. You're not informing God of something he doesn't know. He's not some uninformed deity. And so when you pray, you don't need to spend time informing God about things. You don't need to help fill in the gaps of knowledge. It's okay to bear your heart out. It's okay to say those things in bearing your heart, but he already knows. And you're not counseling God about a better plan. God, here's what I think you should do about this. That would be absurd. We don't go to God saying, God, let me tell you something that really I think you should do. You say, I don't know anyone who would do that, really. Well, there are people today called open theists, and they really believe that God doesn't know everything. He doesn't know the full future, and he's learning as he goes along, and he could probably help use some of our help. That's a low view of God. 
It's absurd. It's blasphemous. The Bible says in Romans eleven thirty four, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompense unto him again, for of, of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. You're not persuading God to give you something he is reluctant to give. He's not a God who's reluctant to give to you. In fact, look at Matthew 7. Look at verse number 7. You know this, but we need to look at it again. Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you who, whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? You know, back then they had, you know, bread was not all that big. You know, a little barley loaf looked like a little, you know, a little rock, basically. What if your son comes and says, hey, Dad, I'm hungry. Uh, can I have some bread? And what father would say, here, chop on this? It's a stone, but it looks like bread. That's cruel. Or if a son asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? There are some fish that look like snakes. Jesus said, No. You wouldn't do that to your son, would you? Look at verse 11. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Isn't that a great verse? He'll give good things to you if you ask him. He's your Father. And you know what? He's a perfect Father. And you know what? He loves you perfectly. And if you have a need, all you got to do is ask him. He'll help you. No prayer in human history ever changed the mind of God in the slightest because his mind doesn't need to be changed. He already knows everything. He doesn't need our counsel, and he is not reluctant to give us what he knows we need. Well, some people say, well, if he already knows everything, then why pray? Well, prayer does change things. It changes us, for one thing. And, and by the way, God will meet all of your needs, not all of your greeds. He'll give you what you need. Some, sometimes you think you need something when you really don't need it. And sometimes when God withholds something, it's because you are the one who needs to change. We're glad you've joined us today for this broadcast of The Ever Living Story, a media outreach of Grace Bible Baptist Church in Catonsville, Maryland. It's our sincere prayer that this broadcast has touched the spiritual needs of your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ has come into this world to change our lives, to bring us eternal life. And Grace is a local congregation where the Word of God is very clearly preached as you've just seen. Our Sunday morning service starts at 11 a.m., so you still have time to join us. We're located just off exit 17 of the Baltimore Beltway at 1518 North Rolling Road, Catonsville, Maryland. Let me leave you with this thought. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ has changed your life and he wants you to live out every day of it for his ever-living story.